Okay, hello, happy new year and welcome to Access Chat again. This week we've got David Baines on. We're um, effectively doing Access Chat Redux after we had a few technical issues with uh, the recording before Christmas. I'm very happy that Dave's been able to join us. Um, you'll notice that Dave looks like a fish. That's because he's uh, making sure that we uh, keep the bandwidth uh, open and, and capture the video. So he's, he's foregoing um, video streaming for now. But you've got uh, the pleasure of looking at, at um, my ugly mug along with Antonio and Deborah. And uh, you'll have to make that. Uh, <laughs> Make do with Dave, Dave's avatar for now. But Dave is here. You give us a shout, Dave. Hi, Neil. Thanks. Yes, the fish is better looking than me, so it's a good choice. <laughs> but thank you for making the time for coming back. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, having a second stab at this, and, and uh, uh, we, we, we were very keen to have you on in the first place uh, because I think what you do at, at the Matter Center is uh, is really. Um, and, and somewhat different. So, um, so welcome again, and uh, let, let's go get rolling. So, um, I think one of the first things that was really of great um, is center has has come almost from nowhere. It, it, it didn't exist half a decade ago, and um, Amazing stuff there, and um, you're doing it in an area of the world that hasn't really previously um, had a foothold in, in assistive te technology. Actually, you could tell us about it came into being and what it is that, that attracted you out in the first place. It was interesting because MARDA was set up uh, of couple to be interventions on the rights of persons with a disability. And it was a very practical response um, led by Dr. Minister for IC. If you're going to have an inclusive society, if you're going to have everybody involved in, and benefiting from technology, there was a group of people who needed uh, some additional support that to happen. Um, and you're right, that hasn't really been uh, a, a major priority certainly a decade ago uh, across uh, the region. Uh, but it's interesting that that changed significantly uh, over the last few years. I think MARDA has been uh, a big part of that change that's taken place. And, and for me, one of the interesting things about coming to the region is that you were dealing to some extent with a blank sheet. There will have to be a huge amount of work done uh, around accessible technologies and people with disabilities. So it was a real opportunity to look at what would you need to do to build an ecosystem? What would you need to do to build all the elements that make assistive technology successful for people? And uh, so when, when I got the opportunity initially to come out as a consultant, then as an employee, um, it, was, it was quite an exciting opportunity to really check some of the things and test some of the assumptions we had back in Europe and to a lesser extent some of the discussions we'd had with the US. Excellent. And, and um, I, I like the idea of having a sort of greenfield site, as it were. Uh, I think it's quite exciting because we've, in, in the West, we certainly we deal with very much entrenched solutions. Where we've, got the, the incumbent technologies that have, have been tried and tested and deployed pretty much everywhere. Uh, and, and, and people will go to them all, all the time, regardless of whether or not there may be something better out there. So I think it's quite exciting, as you say, to be able to, to go and, and look and, and see whether or not the market is, is ripe for disruption, whether or not there's something better out there. Um, I, I, you know, my experience, uh, certainly working in, in the UK, was that the provision of assistive technology was, ex was really quite fragmented. So either you went to an organisation that dealt with other people with your needs, whether you were blind or physically disabled, or you dealt with it at school level, or then you dealt with it at university, and separately you dealt with employment. And, and part of what was really being considered uh, for MARDA was to draw all those elements together 
um, so that actually we focused on the technology and needs rather than the setting, the age, and so on. And because actually uh, quite a lot of those technologies pervade across ages and setting. So in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, it made a lot of sense um, not to fragment services, but to actually to bring them into one place. And in a fairly small country, that was quite easy to do. I think that's that, that's true, and I think your points about the the fragmentation uh, in the UK are, are very much true. If anything, it's possibly become more fragmented since you left. Um, I, and and I think that the certainly when I when I worked in in the grant provision system that was the DSA, and we were a supplier for the DSA, uh, we would see a massive drop off. Um, from the education environment, which was welcoming of, of people with disabilities and welcoming of the idea of assistive tech. Um, and then people would reach the end of their course and we would contact them and say, did you know there's another grant system available? Uh, it's called Access to Work and you can get most of the same stuff um, that you've used for the last three, four years to help you um, and, and have that in the working environment. And we would see probably about 90% of them just disappear. Uh, some of that's probably down to the, the fragmentation, the different systems and everything else. And some of it is probably down to the fact that um, education sees things differently. Yeah, rightly or wrongly. And you know, certainly we found that here that a lot of the technology that people wanted, they wanted for a range of settings. It wasn't just about their time at work, their time in education or their time at home. Actually, they wanted the technology uh, regardless of that setting. It did seem to me crazy as we were setting up to consider any model uh, that looked at um, multiple assessments for uh, for need, uh, depending on the set on the context, when actually the technology solution maybe needed configuration or minor change as opposed to new, new technology. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Deborah, did you have a question? I do have a question. David, I know that um, a lot of the assistive technology that has been created has been created in English. And so I really was fascinated with uh, the steps that you took there in Cutter to um, try to make sure that there was assistive technology that was available in Arabic. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that was, uh, I think, when I first went to Cato as a consultant and started searching around, I was actually really quite surprised at how little technology for Arabic speakers there was. And considering Arabic is the fifth largest language in the world, uh, I was quite shocked at how little support for Arabic was available. So, so what we did is we began a process of working with AT vendors. Uh, and I've got to thank David Dick for ATIA for helping us connect with vendors and developers in the West to do that. And we put out a series of proposals to um, to developers to say, okay, would you like to bring your product across to Arabic? And we were able to identify solutions that were successful, had a proven track record. And, and we supported the companies to localize their technology over to Arabic. Now, that was quite interesting because what, the way we did that is we didn't just give them a grant and say, go away and do it. What we did was we said, um, OK, we will provide you some funding to reduce the risk of entering a new market, uh, to mitigate those risks. But in return, we will take uh, an agreed number of licenses to distribute that product to people in Qatar. So it's almost like a pre-purchasing system. But it meant the level of risk to companies was relatively small, relatively. Um, but it did mean that more companies were interested. And certainly in the first three years of that work, uh, we saw a, a, a very rapid increase in the number of companies who expressed interest. So we've now got to around about 25, 30 products that have been brought across to Arabic. And now with that critical mass established, we're seeing new products being introduced the Arabic market, which we're not having to stimulate. We're seeing things coming into the market. And for the first time, um, we're seeing uh, the Arabic speaking development community across the Middle East actually talking about developing products from scratch in Arabic. We uh, have just been taking part in a, 
uh, a call for technologies to be developed in Arabic, and the same called the Arab Mobile App Challenge. Uh, and we were delighted because we, we put out some video, we did some training and support to developers, um, and as a result, 51 applications which were uh, submitted to the awards process, which either were designed to be accessible for people with disabilities or designed to meet the need of a person with disability. And that's a huge uh, success to see that community starting to develop uh, for that community. And, and you know, David, um, I, I think that that is such a success story and something that we need to emulate all across the world. I, um, I, I was lucky to get to speak at the United Nations on December 3rd, the International Day of Disabilities, and I was on a panel with the ambassador from Brazil. And one thing that we see, I know Antonio will appreciate this, one thing that we're seeing is the Portuguese people, the Portuguese speaking people are getting together and they've signed treaties and they're actually going to try to uh, follow the direction that um, you have taken there in Qatar with Arabic. So uh, I am very, very optimistic about um, what you have done to lead us down this path. And David Dichter is a wonderful leader, but it, this is really exciting to see what's happening to make sure that everyone can get access, everyone, not just English speakers. And, and I think it's, I mean, we, we've, we've done a gap analysis of where there was still big challenges for Arabic speakers. And really now we're trying to fun, focus on um, some of the substantive issues that are there. So, yeah, there is no really effective control and dictate tool for voice recognition for Arabic speakers. Um, there's small amounts available through things um, like uh, Apple and on Google uh, for short messaging and so on. Um, we also uh, very much identify that the cost of text to speech in Arabic is increasing the cost um, of uh, assistive technology because the licensing for voices is actually quite expensive. Now that creates a barrier to the development of new assistive technologies. One of the things that MARDA is trying to do is to find ways to withdraw some of those barriers so that more developers can, can introduce technology for Arabic speakers at a lower cost. That's, That's interesting. One of the interesting challenges. I think that, that, that something that I came across um, when I was developing um, mobile applications was the great disparity in pricing models for the same technologies depending on what your application of that that was so for instance text-to-speech and OCR are commonly available technologies and they're integrated into all kinds of workflow apps business card scanners um, or, or games or whatever but when we approached the people that owned these technologies and said you know what we want to make an assistive technology application for this the pricing model that they applied was significantly different. So, um, so we ended up um, paying anything between ten and a hundred times more than um, than people that were <laughs> distracting by Deborah's phone here. Uh, <laughs> between ten and a hundred times more than people that were developing for games, whereas they were paying, uh, you know, fractions of a cent. We'd be paying anything up to seven or eight euros. Per license, which, yeah. which again doesn't help the the technology scale. Um, I think that lessons learned from that um, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't tell you it's assistive technology. Just tell them that you're doing a freemium app, or, or I, I don't know, but it, 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 or, or try and get the word gamification in there somehow. And and I think that the price that you pay per license will be significantly less. Their expectations for you to hit the numbers will be quite a lot higher though. Um, and I am, yeah. I am interested also in, in the stuff that you're talking about with, with the mobile competition and maybe we'll follow that up later on. But I know Antonio's also got a question. No, uh, uh, I, I have a, a, a question uh, about that that relates to this in in the terms of so you have so you have all this uh, 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 software development uh, uh, happening out, out there and is, do you have a, a matrix something that you are able to identify all this uh, all these type of software what it does uh, is that information available in English 
Uh, how is it possible to compare uh, applications that are being developed in the Middle East with applications that are being developed in UK and in the United States or even in, in South America? Is there a place where, where we can find all this information in one place and compare everything in one? You mean whilst it's in development or, or when it's completed? No, is, is there something in there that, uh, that is available where we can compare all these solutions? Well, what, what we did, I mean, because we were really interested in, I mean, the other thing about Cato is it, it's, it's a very um, multicultural uh, country. So English is very, very widely spoken. We quite often get people to see us whose first or second language is English rather than Arabic. Um, so. A lot of what we do is bilingual anyway, so we're dealing with both English and Arabic uh, all the time. So one of the things that we did is we set up what we called the MARDA portal as an online repository of information about what assistive technologies were available, both in English and in Arabic. There wasn't a lot of point of telling Arabic speakers what was available in English, however. That was just sort of so sort of dangling something in front of them and saying, yeah, but you guys, you're not allowed this um, because you speak Arabic. But equally well, uh, you know, for English speakers, uh, a big website in Arabic telling them what was available in Arabic was also only of limited use. For bilingual people, they could use both. So what we did do was we set up the, uh, the MARDA portal um, really to document uh, and support what was available in different languages. And it also led us into communicating, providing information about what was available built into platforms in both languages and what was available through open source. Um, and we've seen some really interesting open source projects beginning to develop which support Arabic. Um, so it's not just commercial and proprietary software, but trying to see that continuum of design uh, and licensing um, being made available. And and on on on, the, on those platforms, uh, you ha do you have any data about people from from other countries be, uh, that are accessing to to that to that source of information? We, we we're definitely seeing anecdotally quite a lot of circles. So within the Gulf the GCC, we know that the MARDA portal and the repositories that have been set up are used across the Emirates. We've got connections with people in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Um, uh, Egypt and so on, who are all using those resources. And one of the things that I wanted to do when we set up all of our information resources are published under Creative Commons. So that makes it very easy for other Arabic speaking um, services as they emerge and develop to take that information and redistribute it to their own uh, local community without having to ask us for permission. And again, we've got a lot of support from the AT community around the world. Uh, one of, I think one of my favorite stories is uh, I went to visit the um, uh, Department of Education in Washington uh, very early on and they agreed and gave us uh, approval to use a whole bunch of the information resources they had created and to re rethink those and redevelop those for Arabic, which we did and we sent it to them and it was very useful. And about 18 months later after all this work had been done, I got a phone call um, to say that they had and some of the information resources had been localized for Arabic in Qatar, in schools in Detroit, for Arab, where there was a big Arabic speaking community. So That's the cool. work that we've been That's provided, cool. the support we've been provided from uh, the government there, had come full circle and was now speaking <laughs> Arabic speaking Americans in Detroit. And I thought that was a fantastic loop that had gone on. If you made things of those, you put them out, promote and extend them, people will use them if they're made available to them. Yeah, that's that's so important. Uh, the the often it's the, it's not the knowledge that's lacking; it's the it's the ability to access this technology. So putting stuff out as as Creative Commons is really really important. And uh, in in terms of the uh, of the work that Mada is doing to develop uh, symbol libraries for people uh, that are unable to to speak, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, this was, this was the, the third area we, we really picked up on a gap. We started with doing some work with um, some of the uh, AAC apps, and we've, we've done some quite interesting work with uh, Crick, Crick Computer, with Flickr, with Sensory Software, with Grid2. So, um, really, um, 
localized their products and the symbols that they had for Arabic speakers. But we realized quite early on that just translating the symbol uh, and changing the, the word underneath them to an Arabic word wasn't as effective as we hoped it would be. And it was really because some of the imagery and the, the basis of the, the symbols wasn't familiar to, to the users. And we know that familiarity is really important. So what we've done is we've, we, we received some funding from the Qatar National Research Fund to build from scratch an Arabic library. And we worked, we worked in the University of Southampton, the EA Drafen, um, with Hamad Medical Corporation, which is a big, the big health service here in Qatar, and Asad Harder, to build uh, a, a symbol library in Arabic. And starting conceptually from the structure and nature of Arabic, rather than translating something that had been done previously. Now, what we're then going to do is, as this starts to build, uh, we're starting now to talk to AAC developers to say, look, we're going to build this library of Arabic symbols and we're going to publish it under Creative Commons. How can you use that library? How can we make that available to you in what format, in what style, with what information, so you can build apps and products on it? Um, using it from the beginning. So again, it's, a, it's part of trying to put together a building block for access technologies. And I think it, it, this is the first time which we've really begun to grapple with at that really, really basic level and fundamental level. Okay, so, so you, you obviously, you have, you have a, a, a strong connection with the people developing that, that technology. Could that technology also be used for other purposes? What is the, uh, is there any connection with artificial intelligence here? Um, not at the moment, but it's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, with the symbols what we're doing, we're really dealing with um, people with emerging literacy and augmentative and alternative communication. But certainly, that once that library is constructed, then the whole nature of using those symbols to communicate meaning, uh, to contextualize the use of symbols, um, to predict the, the symbols that are required, um, is something which you know, we would hope to see then developers thinking, actually, again, here's a way in which we can build a product on uh, a, a symbol library um, at very low cost and not have to consider extensive licensing for those products. Dave, I think you hit the nail on the head. For me, when um, you talked about conceptualizing, I think that, that you, you were doing quite a lot of work with crowdsourcing. Um, that I, I remember having to go through and, and vote about the, the, the various symbols. The VA wrote me in on, on some of <laughs> sure um, And I think it was really interesting because um, Absolutely, people view uh, and, and take meaning from symbols differently depending on what context they're in. So, um, taken outside of a Western uh, a Western context, some of these symbols, uh, symbols are obviously meaningless. But I, but I actually think that the, 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 the work around context has much greater um, value because how you going to use it generally um, will change depending on on context. You know, context whether or not you're at home in front of a computer, context in terms of whether or not you're out driving, or whether you're working right now, or or um, using your your um, connectivity for leisure. The context changes, and, and 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 people's interpretation of meaning changes. So I think it's really interesting the stuff that you're doing. Yeah, and I, I think one of the, the things that um, really needs to be thought about is we talk about localization. When you talk about localization with most people, they think that means translation. They think it means about, uh, you know, if you're doing video, it's about alternative, uh, having captions, subtitles in different languages and so on. But actually, uh, localization needs to go that stage further. It needs to explore and understand culture uh, and language as an outcome of culture. Absolutely. Because that's how we start to break down. And there's a lot of um, words and phrases in English, it can be represented by a, 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 sing, a single symbol, um, which actually have no natural translation into other languages. So then that symbol doesn't con convey the same at all. It, it conveys a phrase, it needs to be represented by a phrase. So um, it, it, it's a lot more complex than some people realize. 
one of the things that we did, and which I think is, is quite helpful and was well received, uh, we built, um, again with the University of Southampton, uh, a website on localization of AT, which really explored the range of issues from very practical things like partnership and funding through to technical issues, through to language and cultural issues as a, as a model uh, where developers could go and look at that before they started uh, going down a process of bringing the product to a new market. Um, so that's, that's something that we think is really helpful to people and certainly helpful for open source developers who really want that to be in the widest possible market if it's going to be successful. I can see Neil's... Yes, Neil. We can't hear you, Neil. Ah. Ah. <laughs> help. I took myself off mute. Um, now, we, now we can hear you again. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think that the, um, the, the work that you've done with AAC is particularly interesting uh, in terms of where the market is going and, and how I see AT going in general, because the AAC market has been completely disrupted. Um, I, more so than any of the other um, assistive technology markets. The, the kit used to be very, very expensive, you know, um, proprietary, and now you're seeing um, freemium apps on an iPhone replacing, you know, a five thousand dollar piece of kit. Um, you know, and, and this app costs, you know, pennies virtually. Um, so. Whilst I, I kind of I feel sorry for for people that invested careers and lifetimes making this uh, making this stuff, um, there. At the same time, I, I'm celebrating the fact that this the, the the technology is now freely available to anyone that can afford a phone. Now you still need an iPhone, but they're dropping in price. You know, the, you, you you can buy. I, they still supply iPhone fours in India, and 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 generally speaking, it's still a fraction of the cost of AAC kit. Um, and you get all of the benefits of internet connectivity and all of the other built-in um, benefits of smartphones. So, I, I think it's it's an indicator, a leading indicator, if you like, of of where I I see uh, assistive tech as an industry going. And I think that. The the um, the suppliers of the the big vendors, the big software houses within assistive tech, ought to be uh, sitting up and taking notice and and uh, potentially you know revising their business models pretty quickly because I think yeah. they are going to get gobbled up. Yeah, and I think you know there's a lot. Um, certainly, those business business models have got to change, and I think the fact that we're looking at a globalized uh, assistive technology market actually could help them in that area. Um, it's not going to be enough simply to buy a product and then download lots of content for it. People are going to have to maybe see a reduced price from initial content, and then as you purchase the content that you want, uh, you add on and it becomes that, that premium model. I think a lot of people will pay, for instance, for AC grids that have been well designed already and need minor modification for different people, as opposed to uh, extensive work designing individual grids uh, having paid a lot of money for the original software. But I think the other thing which we haven't really got to grips with yet is what is going to be the implication of the shift that's happening um, for AT services. So we know that the industry, the designers, the developers, the distributors of the technology uh, are having to respond. But actually it's going to mean that we, those of us who advise, assess, train, are also going to have to respond to this changing uh, scenario that we see ahead of us. Are you are you alluding to the the, the subscription model of services here, which um, I, I know we've talked about previously, has actually been quite tricky for um, some organisations to to adopt. Yeah, well, there's two things there. There's, there's the subscription model for software and applications, um, and I think that's going to be really difficult for AT services to enter into open-ended commitments to fund a, uh, a subscription to a piece of software on an ongoing basis. I think uh, you know, governments find that difficult, uh, AT organizations, disabled people's organizations and NGOs are going to find that almost difficult, almost impossible to fund because they're entering into a long-term commitment. They may not, don't know if they're going to have the money to, to uh, meet in the future. 
But also, I think uh, the 80s services are going to become, everybody seems to think this is going to become much easier because the technology will be built into a platform. But actually, we've got some really difficult decisions to make in our advice and assessment of people in the future. What form factor are we going to choose? And you know, those the, the range of form factors, the introduction of wearable computing is going to change the way uh, the choice is there. Which operating system and ecosystem do we recommend? Is it going to be Apple? Is it going to be Windows? Is it going to be Android? Or, or whatever comes out in the future? All of these need to be configured, modified. For the first time now, we need to say not only um, what platform, what form factor, what operating system, and also what range of accessible content is available within that ecosystem. And these are all much more complex decisions for assessment than perhaps we've had in the past. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I know Deborah wanted to, to to ask about business, and I can I can I'll I'll let you speak in a second, Deborah. I don't want to hold the line, but it's definitely the case that um, working in a constrained enterprise environment, you control the ecosystem, and and therefore it's 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 easier to do all of this kind of stuff. But with bring your own device, etc., then you're opening up those those very same questions. So Deborah, I I, I know you've been champing at the bit, so I'll mm -hmm. shut up now. Well, no, because I think that the I think that it's a very, very interesting um, conversation. So, I um, every time I get to talk to David, I, he always gets me spellbound. So, it, it, because they're proving there what the rest of us can do, it's very exciting to watch what's happening in Qatar. Uh, David, I know that you are now starting down. There's already been efforts in Qatar with employment, and um, I don't know if that's something that you want to talk to here. But I know that's something else that you're you're now looking at. In a way, I find it fascinating how y'all you started differently than a lot of other countries. You you like solved some of the assistive technology problems so that people with disabilities actually could be more successful in the education system and the employment system. And um, the, I, I continue to look forward to learn from what you are doing. But I was wondering if you wanted to address that here. Yeah, I, I think it's still. Um the underlying issue that we've all grappled with for, for years, um, not just in Qatar, but actually, you know, I think we've all dealt with it in our own, our own location, is you can have policy and law, but that needs to be supported by uh, the attitudes and commitment of employers to the delivery of that. Um, and that, that takes time for them to understand we're not asking you to do this because we want you to be nice. We're not asking you to do it um, because uh, this is something which um, is going to make your life difficult. We're asking you to do this because this is good for your business uh, and it's good for the country. And we're expecting you to do it, not asking you. I, mean, I think attitude change, but you can only really, it's, it's a catch-22 job because if you can't demonstrate within a culture that this works by having the tools, the support services, Make, lets people succeed and become role models. Um, it's really hard to change those attitudes if you can't actually point to somebody and say, look, this is what happens if you do it right. So yeah, you have to be working at both at the same time. You have to put in place those tools, the support, the training, and at the same time use that to product, produce case studies and role models that change attitudes with employers. Um, and yeah, it's challenging at times. Uh, Deborah, uh, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, thank you, Antonio. I, I think that's such a really good point, David, because being somebody from the United States that um, has been in this business a long time, but also as a mother of a daughter with a, a developmental disability, a lot of times when I go over to different countries to talk about these issues, there's it's, um, the, the illusion that the United States or the United Kingdom or some of the, the Western countries have figured it all out. They've gotten yes. all the employment where I just figured it out. And boy, that is not true. It's not true. Um, and I, I, I think that that is one of the um, difficulties we sometimes face is that there's this view, well, who has already sorted it all out? 
and we're all we're still working through a process, all of us, as to what is the best way to resolve some of these issues. Um, but I do think that you do need success stories from within a country, a community, a culture. Um, you know, we can point to people around the world who are wonderful role models. At the end of the day, somebody's going to say, now show me somebody here who this has been successful for. Um, because they want to know that actually that success is based on what can be done here, not what yeah. can be based and done somewhere else. Absolutely. How does it relate to me? How, how does it yeah. relate in our, our, our context? And, and I would also say, David, um, not to try to embarrass Neil and Antonio, but um, I think it's so exciting to see companies like HOS here having these conversations, leading these conversations, because if the employers and the corporations are not right here in the middle of this conversation saying, well, you know, this is what we've done, these are our successes, do we have a long way to go? Um, I, I don't think as a community we can, the countries can't be successful without these guys in the room, you know. So it, it's, uh, progress is being made because of the leadership we he see here with Neil and Antonio and Atos as well. So kudos to them. Yeah, I, I think there are some interesting uh, challenges, Deborah. One of the things that I, I've seen, and if we take, um, let's take a look at physical building accessibility, just as an example, to, so we're not talking about anybody. One of the things that interests me is, say, uh, a major brand of restaurant tries to open a restaurant here in Qatar. And if they were opening that restaurant in Europe or the US, they would automatically ensure that that restaurant was accessible. When they open a brand here, a franchise or directly run, they don't bother. Now, that raises some really interesting questions for me about how real the commitment of some organizations to inclusive design and accessibility. Are they doing it because they actually believe in it? Are they doing it for a business case, in which case you think they would do the same here? Or are they doing it because they're scared of bad publicity um, or the law? And it's the latter part. You know what? We haven't won the battle for hearts and minds then. They're only doing it because they have to. Right, right. I think that does does vary from company to company, um, but I, I think it's a very valid point. I think that um, I think when it comes to things like software, where it, it crosses boundaries much more naturally, um, companies like Microsoft and I've quizzed them on this uh, as how do they how do they approach this is that their their stated response is well we we comply with the most difficult. Or we aim to comply with the most difficult set of legislation that we can comply with, because then everything else below that cascades. Um, obviously, when it comes to localization of their products and, and so on, then they're missing out on certain bits, because as, as you know, the, you know, you've got things like speech recognition that's pretty mature within English speaking uh, and some of the European languages within the Microsoft product set, but you, you haven't got that maturity uh, in Arabic. So um, again, it's, it's lagging behind, but um, but I, I, I do think that that some of this is down to individual company culture. A lot of it is still pushed by the, the legislation, and that um, whilst I'm not a big fan of, um, of class action lawsuits, and I'm, I'm, I really don't like the idea of everyone just suing for the hell of it, there, there, there is a place for um, for class action within the, the, the broad spectrum of the stuff that happens, where companies time and time again refuse to comply with those laws. Yeah, there, there needs to be some some bite to the legislation. If it's not if it's not um, individuals and in class action cases, then the governments need to be uh, the regulation the regulators within the various companies need to enforce those laws. Uh, Dave, uh, I, I just want to pick in something that you were saying uh, related with the stories. Uh, are you using any platform, any sort of resources to bring those stories to, to everybody? You know, those success, success stories that you have built with the groups out there, uh, how are you able, uh, passing that message? Because I think that can also help 
companies to see good examples of, of practices and then when they when they need to, to work in, in, in other countries they may look at that and realize okay let's stop here uh, there's some very good stories here we need to to catch up we need to do this in the way that they are doing yeah we're having to look at this really closely at the moment when we opened we, we really tried to spread those stories through the use of Twitter and Facebook <coughs> But, and social media was very powerful for us initially, but actually keeping track of the use of social media within the, the different groups is, is really important. Because what happens in Qatar is we're seeing a massive and major shift away from the use of things like Facebook uh, and Twitter. Still people are using YouTube a lot, and that's very successful. But actually it's programs like WhatsApp and Snapchat which are being used massively, uh, and uh, Instagram. So people really, really like social media that's based on use of images. Um, and, and that's what actually people are, are following, sharing, sending viral, uh, is that type of uh, material. So um, you know, again, this brings us back into sort of some of the cultural and localization issues that maybe the, the technologies that have proven very effective elsewhere in terms of promoting and publicizing those case studies are not going to be so successful here because the platforms are not the ones of, of choice uh, for the community within which we live. Uh, so I think that's, that's something which people have to keep a very, very close eye on and not make assumptions. That's a really, that's a really great point. Um... I know, Deborah, you, you said you had um, one more question before we, we wrap up. Um, no, it, it, um, David already covered it, so I'm good. But it was a great, great, great interview. Go ahead, Neil. Okay, so um, once again, Dave, thank you very much for, for sparing us the time twice over. Um, You're welcome. I just, I'm going to make a quick plug. I'm going to be at uh, ATIA uh, in a couple of weeks' time. I'm, I hope I bump into a couple of you there. Um, but really interested, this, if this goes out before then, uh, if people are interested in working with us in Qatar or in the region, either uh, looking at possible working in Qatar or acting as consultants and so on, I'd love to sit and talk to you and discuss the sort of things that we're looking for in the future. Um, we want to involve and, and integrate with the, the wider group around the world as much as possible. Uh, and. Uh, if that's an opportunity, whilst I'm in Florida, I'd uh, be delighted to meet Dr. B. Okay. I won't be in Florida, but I, you know, I, I am interested, certainly, in having conversations with you around uh, the, the development work. We're running competitions around wearables and assistive and uh, tech and how that might help. I've got my um, Galaxy Gear fit on my wrist as we talk. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just l I, I know that you know I, I may extend this if if, if you would. I, I but uh, I don't want to uh, to go and, and close this interview be, be, without asking you: Is there any breathtaking technology that we can expect coming from your side of the world? Um, breathtaking technology that will come from our side of the world. I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that, Antonio. Um, I think. What, what you're going to see is as this market matures, you're going to see new things coming through. Because of it, uh, it, we're working from a different starting point. It's not a reading culture um, that, that we have here. Reading is not something that is regularly done for fun. So that means that when we design applications, content, and material, we start from somewhere else. And I think what you will see is possibly the creation of new technologies that are not have not grown out of large amounts of text uh, but other ways of communicating uh, and connecting to each other uh, and I think that will be very interesting is to see whether or not those different starting points will lead us to different technologies oh well I don't know that does sound really interesting especially as someone that's dyslexic um, yeah, yeah. Living in a world that is filled with text is um, is something that I've, I've grown to deal with, but it's not my my favoured medium. My favoured medium is is this: is talking, is visual, is is all of those things. Um, so that sounds that sounds fantastically interesting, and it'd be really great to see a different part of the world driving that. That sounds that sounds really good. 
So I, I am going to have to wrap it up because we try and stick within our time format. So thank you again, and um, we'll be we'll be putting this up very shortly. Take Thanks a lot, Jordan. It's, it's been a pleasure, and uh, uh, I look forward to chatting to you some more when I see you next. Great. Thanks. Bye bye.